Okay. okay. Uh, can we start? I think it's it's time already, right? Okay. Uh, one second. I just not. Uh, um, okay, dear friends and colleagues, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Gela Merabishvili. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Social Sciences, or CSS. Uh, exactly one month has passed since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, many of us follow the military and political developments of the war daily and even hourly. Uh, today's discussion, however, allows us to take a step back a little bit and uh, think about the war's effects on the wider region. Uh, the main focus of uh, our today's meeting is to discuss the implications of this war on Georgia, but also on the uh, wider uh, region, Eastern European slash post-Soviet space. To discuss uh, these topics, we have invited three speakers scholars and practitioners of politics who specialize on Georgia and also on the wider uh, region, region. Now, let me intro introduce uh, them one by one. Our first speaker, uh, Professor Neil McFarlane, uh, is a Lester B. Pearson Professor of International Relations at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's a specialist on Russian foreign policy and the regional dynamics of the former Soviet Union. Between 2010 and 2013, he was a visiting professor at CSS. Our second speaker, uh, Dr. Nat Alexabanadze, is the Cyrus Vance uh, Visiting Professor of International Relations at Mount Holyoke College. Previously, she served as Georgia's ambas ambassador to the European Union. She specializes in foreign policy of the European Union, but also in the questions of nationalism, uh, national minorities, and ethnic conflicts. And our third speaker, uh, Dr. Maximilian or Max Frass, is a policy advisor, researcher, and evaluator with over 15 years of uh, experience of policy analysis for international organizations. He specializes in international development and uh, public policy with a geographic focus on Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Uh, before we start, um, again, once again, I'll tell you a little bit about the structure of our uh, uh, today's meeting. All the three speakers will give a brief uh, presentation, about 15 minutes or, or less. Uh, the, uh, these three presentations will take up the first half of today's event, uh, and the second half will be devoted to the Q&A discussion between the audience and the speakers. Uh, you can submit your questions by writing in the common chat, and then I will uh, read them out loud. Uh, please also ind indicate uh, to whom you are addressing uh, your question. Uh, altogether, today's discussion will last for an hour and a half, uh, and this discussion is already being recorded, and it will be uploaded to the CSS webpage and the Facebook page, I think. Um, okay, uh, with that, let's move on to the main part. So our first speaker is Professor Neil McFarlane. Uh, Neil, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gela. Uh, can you hear me, first of yes. all? Thumbs Perfect. up? Okay, yeah. good. Um, I've had a lot of unfortunate experiences with, with Zoom where you end up talking for a long time and nobody hears you. Anyway, um, <clears throat> this is a really good timing for CSS on this topic because as you mentioned, Gela, we're now one month into this uh, war. And also we have the NATO council meeting today. Now I should say I'm an academic, uh, this is what I do. I try to be dispassionate and analytical. It's actually a hard time to be dispassionate now. Russia invaded Ukraine without provocation. <clears throat> the invasion is a crime of aggression and the laws of war. As they've run into difficulty in their ground offensive, they've turned to indiscriminate attacks on civilians causing massive casualties. That is a violation of both international humanitarian law and international criminal law. It's also plausibly a violation of the Genocide Convention. There's also concern that uh, stymied at the level of conventional military operations, they may turn to weapons of mass destruction. Now, most reasonable people 
I have to say, I think anyway, are outraged by Russian behavior. They are sorrowful about the impact of Russia's war on Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity and its infrastructure, and most importantly, its people. The deaths, the injuries, and the 10 million Ukrainians who are internally displaced and 3.5 million Ukrainians who have fled their homes across Europe. <clears throat> Finally, I think we feel a strong sense of solidarity with Ukraine and its people as they courageously struggle against foreign invasion by an autocratic authoritarian power. Now, I share this indignation as most people do. Now, I had to get that off my chest, Gela, I'm sorry. Uh, it, but it's important to say this. Let's turn to the academic analysis. <clears throat> my task is to discuss the wider international implications of this crisis. I mean, I thought about talking about the evolution of affairs in Ukraine, but everybody watches the same news feeds that I do, so there's no point. Um, I think that before I get to the discussion of international implications, it's useful to discuss why we landed in this mess in the first place. Uh, well, we, we landed in this because Putin put us, put us in it. Um, so why did he do that? Here, we, we have understood for some time that he's trying to uh, do at least, at least two things, one, to reconstitute an exclusive sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, and secondly, to return Russia to its status as a preeminent power in international relations. We also know that he apparently believes that Ukraine is part of Russia, that the Ukrainian uh, state is a Western construction of some sort, which is artificial, and that Ukrainians and Russians are one people. Leaving aside these romantic fantasies, I think we know that he has made a, some, a number of serious miscalculations in moving towards this invasion. I'll mention three. He underestimated the difficulty of implementing his objectives, possibly reflecting that, room, that romantic fantasy he apparently assumed that uh, the Ukrainian government would collapse with a light invasion. That failed. The Ukrainian government did not collapse, and the Ukrainian military held. And the Ukrainian people resisted. And by the way, that includes Russophone and Russian ethnic Ukrainians. Uh, they seem to have been united by something, finally, and that was Russia. Um, the net effect militarily that in, in uh, four weeks, the Russians have had more combat deaths than the United States had in 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. That first underestimation is linked to an overestimation of Russian combat capability. Russia in theory completed a major military reform in the last 10 years, focusing on splitting into smaller combat groups with combined arms capability. So infantry, armory, uh, armor and artillery and air all operating in close coordination. They also completed a massive uh, weapons modernization. And I, uh, mea culpa, and uh, we are all guilty of this, we overestimated the, the effectiveness of these reforms. Um, the reality is that the Russian military has implemented its mission uh, in a grossly incompetent way. And I'd be happy to expand on that in the, in the discussion if anybody wants to, me to. But the summary point would be that the Russian invaders were using older equipment and there was very poor coordination between infantry, armor, and air. Uh, uh, parenthetically, in this context, I saw a video a couple of days ago where there was a Russian tank column somewhere in southern Ukraine where uh, the first tank was disabled by presumably a Javelin missile, and that stopped the entire column, and then 10 more tanks were destroyed from the sides. 
And my question was, didn't they learn anything from Grozny? Because the reason that they lost so many tanks in Grozny was that there was no infantry defending armor as it moved forward. And the same is true now. I mean, sorry. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, so there was very poor coordination between infantry armor and air. Uh, and thirdly, Putin also radically underestimated the Western response. Now here, we have some responsibility. You, you, I don't need to talk to a Georgian audience about Georgia in 2008. What happened happened. What did the West do? Nothing. So he got a free pass on that one. Then we have Ukraine in 2014. There was a response. It was modest sanctions with no profound effects on the Russian economy, or for that matter, on Western investment in and technology transfer to Ukraine. So this was empty as well. A third example would be uh, those of you who are of a certain age will remember uh, the use of chemical weapons in Syria by. Russians and Syrians against the Syrian population. That is what it was. But the interesting thing there was Obama had a red line on the use of chemical weapons at that time. The Russians and Syrians crossed the red line. The United States did not react. My point here is that we have given, we gave Putin some encouragement to continue with aggressive behavior because we didn't react effectively. What he did not understand is that we were slowly learning too. We were learning that these cases were not one-offs they formed a pattern of an increasingly reckless rogue state that had no respect for international law and norms. He also did not understand that apparently that Ukraine is different for the West than Syria or Didi Bodishis Sakafilo. Um, it's not different for me, but for Western policymakers, it is different. And the reason it is different is that um, Ukraine borders directly on three NATO and EU member states. Um, Georgia, to my regret, does not. This is a good point, a moment to turn to my uh, main theme. I realize that my time is running out, Chairman. Um, so I will be quick here. And that's the international implications of Russia's attack on Ukraine. I confess that my thoughts on this are pretty inchoate, uh, not exactly disorganized, but not fully developed. And the reason for that is it's a bit early to draw definitive conclusions. Think my, things might change suddenly. In other words, there might be contingencies arriving that might alter my predictions. But I think I can give you some, a sense of the direction of travel. I guess I'll focus on three things and end with a comment as professors of international relations do on uh, international relations theory and the, the war, the theoretical wars within the discipline, the discipline of international relations. My first comment is on Europe. Um, there is a clear consensus, which I expect to be confirmed today in Brussels on Ukraine. Uh, there is agreement on increasing forward deployment um, and the addition of new NATO battle groups to the Eastern borders of Ukraine, of, of, of the uh, NATO area. 
In other words, Putin is getting exactly what he wanted to prevent. He wanted to prevent NATO permanent deployment in new member states along the periphery of the former Soviet Union. And this is exactly what he's getting as a result of his behavior, by the way. Uh, the trend in defense spending in NATO is uh, very quick and very positive. Uh, there, I think most states will move to the 2% uh, quota or target as a, uh, as a percentage of GDP. Um, and that would even include my home country, Canada, which is not exactly a well-known militaristic state. Um, Germany, as NATO's major European member, has abandoned its policy of no arms transfers to zones of conflict and is directly supplying Ukraine with advanced weaponry. This is something very new and a sea change in NATO affairs. And uh, the and they're also increasing their defense spending by 100 billion euros in two years to hit their 2% target. Forgive me for saying this, but NATO for the last 30 years has been an institution searching around for a mission. Now it appears to have found one. And uh, oddly, their mission is the old one not something new. Uh, it was defense against defense and deterrence regarding the Soviet Union in the past, and now it's defense against Russia. Turning to the EU, and I, I would defer to uh, your former ambassador to the EU from Georgia on this one, but my sense of it is that the European Union has long wanted a common foreign and security policy. The first official documentation on this was from 1992, which is 30 years ago. Now it has one. This reminds me of uh, John Mearsheimer's uh, Back to the Future article of 1990, where he was predicting uh, a return to great power contestation in Western Europe. Now, the back to the future idea is right. It's just that the back part is wrong. Which back are we going back to? It appears we're going back to where we were in the Cold War, i.e. the unity of Western states in the face of a serious and imminent threat of from the East. I conclude the European uh, part of this discussion um, with a comment on European aspirations at the end of the 1990s. Those of you of a certain age, like me, will remember the Charter of Paris for a New Europe, in which all of the members of what was the CSCE, and it turned into the OSCE, agreed on one Europe whole and free. I guess my view is that that bit of imagination is now dead. Instead, we are once again drawing lines of confrontation across Europe. And the real question, not least for Georgia, is where the line will be drawn. Which side is Ukraine on or Georgia on in this division, this redivision of Europe? Uh, thirdly, and briefly, there's the Euro-Atlantic area, uh, i.e. NATO. There was some doubt recently about US commitment to Europe and to NATO. You, you, we can mention Trump's suggestion that the United States might just withdraw from NATO, or Obama and the pivot to Asia and away from Europe, or, Obama, or Clinton practically, with the drawdown of US combat forces in Europe. Well, that's also over. 
the United States is rapidly increasing deployment out, uh, onto the front line in the East. Um, fourthly, China. What does this have to do with China? The bottom line here is that the implementation of deep sanctions on Russia will disconnect Russia from the global economy, and that is likely to pull Russia closer to China, to make it more dependent on China. That's good news for China, but probably bad news for Russia, but that's, that's way out in the future. And the final point here is that, um, is the global economy. What does this mean for the global economy? This is not a very nice picture and it has serious implications for lots of people. The EU, the US, Canada, Australia, South Korea, Japan, and Switzerland all now have robust sanctions design, designed effectively to strangle the Russian economy. Um, we'll see what happens with that and how long it can be sustained. It's going to show. On, uh, then, then there is the question of the risk of disruption of Russian energy supply, either because of war or because of sanctions. The possibility is already having significant effects on energy prices, oil and gas in particular, which were already stressed before this crisis. And I'm sure that's true in Georgia as well. Um, some countries, the, e, the US and the also European states have stated their intention to break the habit of Russian energy imports. The US by the end of 2022, Europe by the end of 2030. One thing we know about energy markets is that they do not like instability and crises. And the effect I think is Con, will be continuing volatile oil and gas prices trending upwards. To me, uh, as a good humanitarian, the real issue in all of this is actually food markets, grain, corn, sunflower oil, all of these are essential commodities, not least in the third world. And also fertilizer. All of these are major exports from Ukraine and Russia. All of them may be impacted by sanctions. So, I mean, if, in the case of the wheat market, you have a supply, a potential supply disruption leading to a price increase, increase which now has come close to doubling global wheat prices. The Middle East is very dependent on the global wheat market. And there, and it is also a very politically viable uh, region. Uh, and I am finishing, Chairman. I'm sorry to go on, but okay, you, you have about one minute or so. Yes. Okay. Well, I will. I will certainly finish in one minute. I may. I should give you back some time then. Um, but uh, and this is a minor detail. Ukraine. Uh, supplies the global market with 70% of global neon gas. Who knows anything about neon gas? I didn't until I found this out. It's essential in the production of semiconductors globally. So if that is disrupted, we're going to have serious disruption along the supply chain involving anything to do with semiconductors. So to conclude, um, I guess I would say one, the unipolar, the unipolar moment is over. Um, and also the notion that we are, uh, that I guess if we were, if history had ended, then I guess we would agree that history has resumed. Um, and I think that in terms of international relations theory, 
I think it will move away. Uh, it, 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 it did move away from realism and towards the liberal global order and constructivist theory. I expect that there was no, that was because there was no substantial power political competition. Now there is. And uh, so to summarize, we're at the end of the end of the Cold War and the end of the end of history. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Neil, for this broad <clears throat> geopolitical overview of the war, um, of its origins in uh, Putin's romantic fantasies, and then its effects, uh, wide ranging effects, um, including economy, the economy of the world. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Nat Alisa Banadze. Uh, Natalie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gela. Very nice to be uh, here. It's um, as Neil started, uh, every time you look at the news, it's one uh, tragic episode after another. So very, very difficult to, um, to live this on a daily basis. Um, but I will talk uh, about implications for Georgia, right? This is, uh, I was asked to sort of concentrate on Georgia and what it all means uh for us um now as in most cases um, uh the implications are wide uh and uh i would separate for better analytical reasons i will separate implications domestic and foreign and then perhaps more broadly uh, something that is intersection of the two now starting with the domestic um implications um I think it was um, surprising, perhaps, how Ukraine uh, war has brought to the fore already existing cleavages uh, in the Georgian uh, political uh, landscape. Uh, and now we see, we have always witnessed these divisions, we have witnessed polarization, we have witnessed the, you know, the, the, the traditional characteristics of Georgian politics, but somehow, Ukraine uh, was another litmus test, and we see certain things perhaps even more uh, clearly. Uh, well, one thing that comes to mind uh, when I look at the way Georgian authorities have been handling this situation is um, it's pushing me to describe Georgia today as a kind of partocracy. Um, and, uh, you know, I lived eight years in a country which is also partocracy, and that's Belgium. But there you have a very fragmented, very pluralistic uh, consensus, consensual kind of uh, deliberative democracy, right? What you have in Georgia is a, a total opposite of it. There is absolutely no deliberative governance whatsoever. We've never been very good at it. But in times of crisis, one might think that you know, you would want to get some extra input in the decision making. It actually has gone in, in, in the opposite direction. So you have decision making entirely concentrated in one party, which dominates both executive and parliament, and which simply dismisses and refuses to take any input from anyone else, whether it's civil society, whether it's academia, or uh, let alone opposition. So there is this kind of um, in my view, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the, the Georgian governing system has boiled down to this single party partocracy. We have had a tradition of one party domination always, uh, but I think we have reached like new heights with this um, current um, uh, ruling party. Uh, another um, element which I find striking is in a way also a deepening democratic deficit. I mean, it's linked obviously to the first part, but you see a very genuine and truly widespread outpouring of um, support for Ukraine, right? You had hundreds and thousands of people out in the streets uh, and it's genuine. I think Georgians feel really uh, strongly about what is going on, uh, anybody does, but we in particular, because we have links, historical, uh, in a way we've lived through the Russian aggression. So it really uh, rings very close to, to home. 
Um, nevertheless, the position that has been taken by the government is probably best can be described as a sort of fence sitting. Uh, they, they explain it for reasons of caution, uh, national security, etc. cetera, uh, fine. But there is, uh, and we can get back to their reasoning, but, uh, but there is no uh, communication whatsoever. So you have this kind of a rift, which is what public feels. Uh, and it is genuine and uh, no uh, attempt from the government which takes a different position to uh, to communicate and explain the reasons carefully and convincingly apart from labeling those who come out in the streets as uh, as those who undermine the country's national security i mean i would like to know why being outside and waving georgia uh, ukrainian flag undermines georgia's national security it might do but I would like to know if this is the position from the government. So in a way, we also see this kind of breakdown in communication and exacerbated democratic deficit. Um, uh, another manifestation and which is also interesting, I think uh, more broadly, if you look, if we look at the Georgian system is this growing rift between the government and president, right? The president took the side of the public and said, well, I express the public. And it is very interesting because her move um, has a particular legitimacy because she is directly elected president. And um, looking at her positioning in this situation, it does make me wonder about Georgia's um, evolving parliamentary democracy it, because uh, she is the last directly elected president. And I have to say, whether you like her or whether you liked her predecessor, it doesn't matter, we all have our opinions. Both of them have tried to sort of carve a, a balancing position. So they, to, to, they have created for themselves an extra role of checks and balances in the system, which is very much dominated by a single party, traditionally and especially now. So I wonder whether going back, getting rid of the directly elected president and having the president elected by part parliament, which again risks to be dominated, you never know. I mean, we should be moving to proportional system, but I don't know anymore whether it was a good idea or not, because I think this, this role that president, both uh, previous and, and the current are playing is very important. Uh, another thing obviously that comes to the fore dramatically is Georgia's traditional political polarization. Um, I say traditional because it has always characterized that, but again, I think today we have reached new heights even in that uh, direction. Uh, there is no space left for normal political contestation in the country. Uh, you are straight away labeled, you know, the, the opposition is labeled, and it's very interesting the way the labeling evolves, right? Before, uh, and normally it comes from, from the government, but opposition is also very much guilty in deepening polarization. I mean, the, the, this is a wonderful tango that goes on for a very long time. But uh, since the authorities have more responsibility, so uh, a lot of the time, the kind of labeling and the black PR uh, comes from, from them. Uh, so before uh, the war, uh, opposition was uh, labeled as destructive, right? It was a destructive opposition. So there was obviously that straight away delegitimizes any desire or move to, to talk to them, right? They're destructive, they're, they, they act uh, contrary to the state interest. So this was the, the characteristic. Today, the opposition is war parties. Uh, these are the people who want to drag Georgia into war. Uh, and again, uh, no uh, discussion is possible. So uh, basically the normal adversarial politics, which is characteristic of democracy, right? And, and it's, it's okay to fight, um, not literally, but this is uh, not taking place because opponents are not just political adversaries in our case, they're enemies that need to be um, either destroyed or their influence minimized or marginalized, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they, they, um, depending, I suppose, who you talk to. So obviously there is no nuance in argumentation, but I find it very interesting, this also changing of the labeling, which 
adds to polarization. Again, obviously, this is the moment which is extremely important for Georgia. Um, and we will talk about it, why. So it could have been also the moment to actually reduce the existing polarization, to create consensus, to say, look, I mean, this is a serious danger. We're all in it together. Um, and, uh, and, and then let's rebuild the ties. Let's return to normal democratic contestation. And yes, let's argue, let's have different opinions, but you know, let's move away from this uh, friend or foe kind of um, position. Well, but that's not happening, obviously. And the final point uh, that comes to the fore as well, and that's relatively new for the Georgian politics, is this kind of tacit question mark about where Georgia is heading, uh, about its Western orientation. I mean, if there was one thing that Georgians across political spectrum uh, used to agree on, it was that if Georgia was going anywhere, it should be going westwards, uh, that we should become part of this Western institutional package. Uh, this is our um, existential interest, uh, and that includes EU and NATO. Um, I think the agreement, the consensus, uh, at least societal consensus, is still there. But because we see what Neil described very well, basically the world divided now in half, and you have on the one hand the sort of authoritarian imperialism fighting uh, the liberal democratic order, um, and Georgia's fence-sitting position obviously raises question, you know, how are we going to pursue our uh, foreign policy uh, goals by assuming this kind of position? And this is, again, a big question mark, which I would like to hear explanation coming from the government. So this moves us to uh, external dimension of uh, consequences related to Georgia. Uh, and obviously, the uh, the two most obvious ones are uh, the EU and NATO, right? How this is all going to affect uh, Georgia's relations, aspirations and ambitions uh, joining both of these um, institutions. Um, and why it is, uh, and sort of linked to this uh, discussion would be why I believe it is in Georgia's interest, again, if interests have not changed, right? If we remain, if the interest remains uh, the, the, the westward, word, westward trajectory, if that has not changed, why it is in the interest of Georgia to position itself uh, close to Ukraine, obviously carefully, but still uh, do it well. Um, now, we can all agree that it is paramount that Georgia is not dragged into war, and uh, this is the official line of the government, and, and nobody, uh, nobody disagrees with this. Um, however, the question is, what are we doing uh, to prepare for possibility of Georgia being dragged into war? It's not excluded, is it? Nothing is excluded. Uh, nobody really believed that uh, mm -hmm. Russia would go into the full-scale uh, invasion. I mean, there were many scenarios, but this seemed just so outrageous and uh, kind of self-inflicting harm that nobody thought it would happen. Uh, and yet it happened. So we need to be prepared for all possibilities. I know, for example, Sweden is under full military preparation at the moment. Uh, and I don't think they believe that Russians will be invading tomorrow. I also don't believe that Putin is interested in invading Georgia at this point, but preparations should be there and communication about it also should be there. Um, he's particular, I mean, if we talk about Putin today, he's particularly dangerous now, I think, because of the very reasons that Neil described uh, very well in his presentation. Basically, he achieved everything he didn't want to achieve on the global scale and everything that he tried so hard for years to fight against, to dismantle, and to be honest, he was on good track. He was almost succeeding. I mean, we saw the West, which was kind of losing its lackluster and was on decline, EU divided, NATO without a purpose, fight between uh, Brexit that had completely destroyed relations with uh, Europe and so on and so forth. And now all of this is reversed in, in an incredible two weeks time. So um, I don't think he's very happy at the moment and particularly dangerous. Um, another point of course is 
security guarantees. Uh, we, are, we, we can start asking the question why uh, Georgia wanted to join NATO in the first place, right? It was not, the reason was not really to annoy Russia. And the reason was to protect ourselves from Russia because we had good reasons to feel threatened by them. And by the way, here is the point which I think is very important to remember that Russian policy of undermining security of neighbors, including Georgia, the Russian policy of dismembering Georgia and undermining its sovereignty and territorial integrity did not start with Putin. And it's probably not going to end with him either, unless special uh, measures are taken to ensure that Russia does not return to this habit. This policy started right after Georgia's independence. Uh, and we've been living this uh, for many years. Russia has an age old habit of undermining security of its neighbors and justifying it as a self defense. Uh, and um, very often, this is just uh, uh, it, it's the kind of measure that Russia takes uh, as, a, as a traditional attitude rather than a response to a particular stimuli, which is why I also think that um, NATO enlargement was simply a pretext for Russia rather than the real, um, uh, real reason uh, for the actions they have taken. So why it is in Georgia's interest to, uh, to be in the kind of same package as Ukraine now? Um, first of all, there are discussions about NATO and whether NATO will further expand or not expand there, we don't know. But obviously we should be talking with our partners because after all, we are very close ally to, to NATO. Um, however, uh, whether we want it or not, uh, it is likely, I'm not saying whether it's for sure, but it is likely that the decision affecting Ukraine might affect us with regard to NATO at least. And we know uh, um, statements from coming from Zelensky that he's considering other options. But what are the other options? I mean, he is talking about security guarantees of sorts, which may be not linked to NATO or maybe somehow linked to NATO, we don't know. But it is very much in our interest to make sure that if there are security guarantees, offered that they're also extended to us. Uh, and for that reason, we need to be there where, where this discussion is taking place and we need to be in the right side of this game. Um, another, of course, question is uh, the European Union. Uh, Ukraine applied to European Union and so did uh, Georgia and Moldova. I think the timing was right. Uh, because uh, the process of application before the war, our relationship with Ukraine, with European Union was looking relatively stalled, partly for our own reasons and uh, largely for the reasons that uh, were kind of domestic European, right? The problem with enlargement, um, uh, reassessment of the whole enlargement policy and the, and the, and the, and the disappointment with it, uh, Western Balkans that are first in the line, Turkey, which uh, is a particular complication, I think, for us because we're further away and Turkey is even before us, etc., etc. So it was looking not easy. And I have always thought that um, Georgia's membership to the European Union would not be the matter of criteria only. Uh, even if we were Estonia of the Caucasus in real terms, it would be still difficult for us to move forward uh, because it is a matter of political decision. So the kind of geopolitical calculations as well. So the kind of geopolitical uh, window had opened up and I think it was the right moment to, to the right move to seize it and uh, and apply but you know this is only the beginning of the process obviously it will be a long process i mean they're talking about expedited procedure which actually does not exist uh and uh you know if there is a real political will obviously it can be invented but i don't see that kind of political will in, in the eu right now for uh, a new procedure to be invented um, and obviously there will be questions about readiness. We all know Georgia is not ready, but neither are Western Balkan states that have candidate status. So if we compare 
the three of us, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, and candidates from Western Balkans, this is perfectly comparable bunch. So moving us in the basket of candidates in this in that basket is already uh, a pretty big deal, and I think uh, uh, an important development. So, but this process is clearly driven by Ukraine. The 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 um, public in uh, in uh, European. Uh, countries was dead against enlargement. And there is now a lot of sympathy for Ukraine. So the, this again is, uh, uh, we, we have to be thankful to, uh, to Ukrainians and for their sacrifices, because in many ways this benefits us again. That's why I think we should be standing by their side in order to, uh, to be there ready. Um, and finally, there is also a question about occupied territories. Now, if we don't know what the post-war settlement is going to uh, look like, right? Um, but if Russians, and I hope that would be the case, are uh, told to withdraw troops from Ukraine, I think it's very important that the same conversation takes place also about Georgia and the troops that are illegally positioned there. Um, but it's not going to happen unless we push for it and unless we position ourselves uh, carefully, but very firmly that this uh, discussion should also cover Georgia. And then there is matter of sanctions as well. I mean, not, we, we, we want certain sanctions also applied in, in our case, but you know, if you, if you refuse to, in such a blatant way, if you refuse uh, to join any sanctions, then it's kind of difficult to ask others to apply, uh, to apply them um, in your case. Uh, so basically, uh, that's where we are. I think in general, we can say, uh, following what Neil was talking, that precise edges of the European Union and NATO were always ambiguous. But now there will be a, a big debate about who's in and who's out. And we can see perhaps Finland and Sweden will join the NATO. And I think it will be increasingly difficult to, um, to sort of be ambivalent. And there will be less and less tolerance for countries like Turkey or Serbia, for example, which is a candidate country, because there is a lot of pressure to take a position. Um, and that is likely to apply to us um, as well. Um, again, uh, when it comes to the membership uh, for those countries that are not quite ready, um, we don't know where the decision making will go, but EU um, is itself has been very much affected by this war. Um, I have to say I've never seen it act so fast and so united. So in some ways, for the first time, the real ambition of European Union to actually become a global actor uh, is shaping up. Uh, and there is the conversation which was very much pushed by Macron about defense and security in the EU now has a complete different uh, reading and legitimacy. And actually last, I think a few days ago, they came up with this global compass, which is all about the security and defense. So we might see transformation of the European Union over time into also defense union, which is also very interesting when we talk about security guarantees, but that's um, down, the road, down the line. So basically what is very important is that if there is a new iron curtain that is about to fall, we have to make sure that we're on the right side, at least this time. Okay. I'll stop here and then the questions. Thank you very much, Natalie, for this quite comprehensive <laughs> overview of domestic and uh, also external politics of Georgia and the effects of Ukraine, Ukraine's war uh, on, on these issues. Our third and final speaker is Dr. Max Fras. Uh, Max, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, Natha, for an um, excellent introduction and a broad overview of, of the topic. I will we allow myself to refer to back to what Neil said. I'm, I'm not an academic anymore, I'm a recovering academic, but um, it's very difficult to be dispassionate about what's happening here. And it's, uh, I cannot really disconnect this from very issues I believe in, I live through, and even my identity. So being born in, in, in Poland and having grown up there and now living in the UK, I'm obviously very happy about all sorts of things that Poland and the UK are doing. And 
and as a committed European and somebody whose heart is in Georgia as well, I'm not very happy about what's happening, first of all, politically and otherwise between Poland and the UK and what Europe is not doing for Ukraine and in this crisis. And also not entirely happy about how Georgia is playing it. But um, what I wanted to focus on is what I, what I work on, which is, which is EU neighborhood policy. And I wanted to focus on the Eastern partnership and partly on European enlargement issues that is partly already touched upon by, by Natalie. So I, I hope I'm, I'm going to, to take a bit less of, of everybody's time and we can move on to, um, to questions. And uh, yeah, when we discussed the, the idea for this, the, this, this discussion, and I said that, well, I can, I can maybe start by talking about um, Eastern Partnership. And then I, I, I had a few conversations with colleagues about um, where it's at at the moment. I wanted to start by talking about Eastern Partnership and sort of regional outlook on what the EU is doing uh, with regards to Georgia relations and then move to specific issues of EU um, Georgia relations. So starting with uh, Eastern Partnerships, there's a few points, um, I think, well, Everybody will say that you know EU EU's neighborhood policy is in crisis. Eastern partnership is in crisis, and, and there's there's a lot that can be said about where we are in 2022, which is a very peculiar moment, and hopefully we won't be repeating this sort of experience as a continent or as a, as a planet too often. But um, it you know if you say Eastern partnership is in crisis, it is in many ways true. But also if you look at where Eastern partnership is coming from, it was actually born in crisis and has remained in crisis ever since it was ever set up. So. Um, it was largely set up uh, as a result of, um, of um, Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008, and his, um, and, and it was a set up, it was considered an important initiative by countries in the region, and we'll come back to whether we can even speak of a region, but countries that are part of the initiative have deemed it important uh, ever since, but then everybody else was saying, well, this, this, this concept is in, in crisis, it was in crisis in 2014, uh, the, the first Russian invasion of, of Ukraine was in crisis in 2020 with, uh, with what's been happening in Belarus. We seem to have forgotten Belarus entirely this year. Um, now, um, it also, was also in crisis after the Karabakh war. So yes, it is, it is definitely in crisis and it's a big one and it's very difficult to make predictions because yes, the, the war is not quite over. And as much as I believe in, in Ukraine's victory, things can play out in, in different ways and it will also condition what's gonna remain of Eastern Partnership as a concept. Um, but if we you know, look at what the, what the Eastern Partnership was good at over the last uh, couple of years, is it was good at de delivering sort of low level technocratic support for reform and there was a political, there was political will for reform. A pretty skilled sort of apparatus moving along a few uh, lines of, of, of democratic reform in all, all, all countries. Uh, but the political underpinning ha had to be there and yeah, we'll have to revisit those commitments now. Uh, so it had a very good potential also to enhance economic cooperation between all countries, and this potential is now also um, heavily limited. So, you know, where, where do we stand in 2022 with, uh, with the concept of Eastern Partnership and in, in EU um, Eastern um, neighbourhood, so to speak? So, you know, in, in relations with the EU, you can say there is, yeah, Eastern Partnership is a region. For, uh, for other purposes, there, there is no region as such. It exists in EU programs, but otherwise, you know, you've got countries looking in, in very different uh, different directions. So it's, it's quite clear that you've got the club of the Association Agreement 3, which is, you know, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova. Uh, Armenia has an agreement with the EU, but as we know, is not fully aligned with the EU on, 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 on geopolitical matters. So um, there is also um, a lot going in there. And then you've got uh, Azerbaijan that on one hand does need and want the EU and an Eastern Partnership. On the other hand, it doesn't. Um, and then you've got Belarus that was well suspended, but now is completely out of, of Eastern Partnership for all intents and, and purposes. So what is what is left of that is the, is the is, well, is cooperation with Ukraine that is now very much uh, and very viscerally a matter of survival for the country, but also a flagship project for the EU. And then you've got Moldova and Georgia. For Moldova, it's, it's been an increased priority for Georgia. I'm not entirely sure. I think Oliver's... Uh, He's here and he's shared a recent paper on sort of Georgia's backsliding and also on, on the EU cooperation agenda. So a lot can be said about you know, what, the, what the EU, uh, what the what Georgian government wants um, of that. Um, but um, well, I think what we, we're going to see, one of the important emerging discussions is, is Eastern Partnership a corridor uh, or a path to enlargement? Uh, it was not framed as such. It was framed as some sort of a placebo, as some sort of a, an alternative. Uh, especially by the EU, uh, not so much by, by Eastern Partnership countries. We, we always say, well, sorry, not all of them, but especially Georgia, Moldova, and, and, and uh, Ukraine had a very clear intention to join 
uh, that you and and they well they have long treated it as a, as a sort of enlargement waiting waiting corridor but I think a big decision moment will come for the EU now um, that they that the Georgia and Moldova and Ukrainian government will try to use it as a waiting room uh, we don't know when the what the EU's decision will be but now the, the ball is very much in their court and I think it was a, a, a good decision by all three governments although coming from different quarters to to apply for membership now that sees the moment and see what the EU says to that. The EU has now kicked it, well, maybe not into long grass entirely, but you know we, we have to wait for the European Commission's decision that's on one hand sort of technocratic, but it's also a way for politicians to shed responsibility and say, okay, we have to let the Commission issue an opinion. It can take three months. And as we, well, we have just seen, you know, 20 years of EU history happening in a month. The things can happen if there is a political push, but we don't know where the political push is at the moment. So it might take the Commission a year or a year and a half to issue an opinion. And by then, as much as I would love Europeans to still be interested in Ukraine, we will have moved to another conflict elsewhere and the momentum will be gone. So I think that those the upcoming couple of weeks and months are, are really very, very important. The accession agreement three, the association agreement three, so Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova will push for, for there to be a de facto waiting room for Eastern partnership waiting room. Uh, and then the other three countries obviously have, have, have different um, interests where the Eastern Partnership can definitely matter and will continue to matter is economically. It has a huge investment fund, and there is actually increased uh, interest uh, among EU member states, and sometimes not for the right reasons. So you know they said let's let's continue economic integration because you know we don't have much to offer politically, but regional integration why not? Let's keep uh, throwing funding. Um, that way. Where I think things are going to get very complicated is the intra-Eastern uh, partnership relations. They were already complicated, so again, you had Belarus and Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Azerbaijan, Armenia sitting in the same room. I mean, Natalie, you, you sat in those meetings, it's sometimes an awkward partnership, but then for, for, for different reasons, you know, you make it work. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to make it work now uh, because of the fact that obviously Ukraine is going to be a flagship project of the Eastern Partnership and the most important country. And also because, well, and I'll be moving to Georgia later, Georgia has not done a great job of supporting Ukraine and this has soured relations and some of it can be rebuilt and, and, and recovered. Um, and I'm sure, especially with the potential change in, in, in Georgia's uh, Georgian government's uh, policy, but some of it just cannot be repaired, at least at the governmental level. Often hear about the about Ukraine's appreciation for what Georgian people, Georgian society, Georgian civil society um, has done. Um, so, as a multinational platform, it's going to be very complicated, probably less important because then you had a lot of partnerships between those countries. It's going to be very difficult now, logistically, politically, otherwise. So, it will be very much about bilateral relations. Um, and if you look at the scenarios, what can happen? I mean, you've got the negative scenario: Russian victory. I really don't want to go there in any sort of way. Uh, but it would be disastrous for the region and for EU's um, eastern uh, neighborhood. The optimistic scenario, we're going back to business as usual. We know that's not entirely likely. Uh, now, the realistic scenario seems to be the Ukrainian victory, but, but not you know, preserving its territorial integrity, but not going to business as usual with the EU. And things will change. And I think what we're looking at is more of a Balkan model. So if you look at Western Balkans, they are referred to as a region, but there is no Western Balkan initiative that they all have to fit under. They, they're, they're, it's very much dealt with on, on bilateral, um, uh, it's very much about bilateral relations and you know, Serbia is not where Macedonia is at the moment and not where Albania is. So there'll be increased differentiation and sort of more bi bilateral cooperation, which is not necessarily um, great news for, for Georgia now because, and here some of those points were already brought up by Neil and then much more so by, by Nata. Um, if you look at you know, where Georgia is, it's not in a great place on, on uh, an EU um, integration. Yes, it has just applied uh, to be a member, and I think that's, that's, there's cause for celebration on that. But I think as far as uh, a week into the war, you've got uh, you know, Georgian, Georgian dreams, uh, PR, Paul uh, of Excellence, Kovachidze saying, well, we're not going to apply yet. We'll wait until 2024 and see how things go. And then, a U I mean, I don't know if you could call it a U-turn, but a kind of a... Um, a triple salto and saying, well, actually, no, I, when I meant we won't, I meant we will. And, and, and then Georgia doing it in, but putting an application in, but on, on a basis of sort of necessary good, not seeing it as an evil, but there's like, if you know it's good, but it's, it's necessary good, so we'll do it. But it, not much enthusiasm um, uh, to do it instantly. And obviously, as Nata was saying, you know, Ukraine sets the pace in all sorts of ways, and, 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 and Georgia just, um, just followed. 
So no, regardless, again, what, what you're going to read uh, on, on, on Georgian Dreams Facebook pages, Georgia is not a, a leader in the Eastern Partnership region, not by any measure, and has not been for a while. Um, uh, and what's been happening over the last couple of months and then weeks is, is, is nothing short of disastrous. So, you know, what the limits on, on, on President Zorabishvili's travel were very, very poorly um, uh, viewed and, 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 and uh, well, shocked, shocked uh, many in, in Brussels. And the fact that you've got, uh, you know, the first non-Russian speaking, so to speak, president in the region who has fantastic democratic, the, the democratic and also, sorry, um, diplomatic potential and could be now talking to, um, the, you know, the interim leader of Europe, we can say that Macron almost directly in, in her mother tongue. And instead of that, you've got her stationed in, in Tbilisi. So, and then other ideas such as, you know, Georgian Dream's idea that, you know, the first reaction to the Russian wave of arrivals and the upheaval was, you know, we're going to use non-discrimination laws that the EU has given us to, to, to protect the Russians. In many ways, a noble undertaking at how selective the Georgian government was in applying those non-discrimination laws and, and protecting various minorities in the country recently, definitely a bad look. So obviously, if you leave the, you know, the PR uh, as, uh, and the communication side aside, which was you know, a, a bad communications was long uh, Georgian dream PR and yet, the trademark, and yet they managed to, to, to move the, the EU agenda forward. Um, they're very tangible signs that uh, Georgia, Georgia is losing out on, on great opportunities. You had the, the, the case of, of macro uh, level financing that was already, um, well, I was, it was not offered uh, or not extended to, to, uh, to Georgia. It was last year, if I remember correctly. Uh, okay, 75 million euros maybe does not make or break Georgian budget, but it's telling of, of what, how the relationship has soured. Uh, at the moment, we have massive the so-called umbrella funds under Eastern Partnership that offer opportunities for investment. They can use, be used on ad hoc, um, on ad hoc um, basis. Um, the, the, is that Georgian government is making in Brussels are not conducive to their release. So other countries might benefit from them, Moldova might, uh, Georgia will, will not. If you look at another dimension of uh, Georgia-EU relations now emerging, Eastern partnership has to now increasingly look at the issues of security and defense. Moldova has already started those conversations in Brussels. Uh, which, I mean, I mean, I'm not a Moldova um, expert, but it, it did surprise me a little bit that they are running ahead on, on defense and, and, and security cooperation, and Georgia is not, and, and at the moment there is no ongoing conversation on that. Um, you've got this economic partnership, Georgia is also not uh, seizing opportunities there. Now, you probably also know that the, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's increased divide between, you know, let's get on with cooperation in the economic realm, forget other issues such as human rights and rule of law, especially. You've got the Hungarian com neighborhood commissioner who is, you know, also has particular views on how rule of law should work because of, of his background and what's happening in his member state. Um, but even all these things considered, the Eastern Partnership said we will look closely at rule of law mechanisms and Georgia is actually under, under close scrutiny uh, under this umbrella. So, you know, I think it takes a lot of effort to upset a Hungarian commissioner on the human, on the rule of law front and, and Georgia managed to get that. So, so those relations are really not looking great um, at, at the moment. And at the mo I just don't see a great political push to do it. Again, necessary, good thing to do. Yes, we'll do it. Um, but we are not going to be, or I see no potential there for Georgia to become a leader in any area of, of European integration uh, going ahead, neither economic, nor political, nor um, social. So I'm afraid that at the moment that Georgia is running a risk of, of st being stuck in no man's land with the relations with the EU. Um, so if you look at it, there's a lot of potential there. Uh, there's a good moment to, to, not, to knock on doors in Brussels, but you're not knocking on them because you've just stopped your president from going there, right? So you're, you know, you, you're not doing this. Um, uh, will there be any uptake for the potential? Well, I think, yes, there'll be enough to, for Georgia to stay on the pro-EU path. It'd be suicidal not to do this, but it will no, not be enough for this to be a driver of reform. And so Georgia will be stuck in this in, the, in, the, in this place where I mean you can look at it as part you know Serbia scenario. Serbia is 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 a superstar of EU integration in the Western Balkans, uh, and, and that's great in many ways. But that's it, it did not really uh, transform uh, Serbia's politics, and it, I think the prospects for for the country in the long term are, are not great. Um, so I think Georgia is is risking being stuck in this. Um, scenario. So kind of, you know, not dropping out, not losing, but also not moving to, to a pole position and uh, just trotting along and letting other countries, in this case, particularly Ukraine, to dictate the pace. Um, yeah, I'll stop there and uh, and back over to you. Thank you.
Thank you, Max, uh, for your overview of uh, Georgia's uh, and Eastern Partnership and Georgia's possible future or non-future in the European Union. Uh, okay, uh, now we can move on to the next half or next um, 25 minutes of the uh, of the of our meeting, which is Q and A uh, discussion. Uh, let me quickly remind you that you can write your questions in our common chat, and then I'll read it out loud. Uh, we already have one question uh, from Oliver Reisner, uh, and uh, let me uh, read it now. Um, Ukraine adopted a very interesting national resilience concept in September 2021, indicating that they were preparing for the worst case uh, that happened already now. I cannot see a similar initiative polarized in polarized Georgia, or is anybody aware of such an attempt? Uh, anybody can answer who is who, who is uh, uh, who is aware of this uh, development. Uh, if I may, I'll, I'll intrude on this. The answer would be no. Mm -hmm. So no such um, thing expected in in Georgia. No, neither there is no document nor there is a discussion around this issue. Uh -huh. Um, and I think what Oliver refers to is in a way echoes what I was saying that, you know, there are issues where you need to create an inclusive process where everybody has a stake and you sort of agree on fundamental national security concerns that, you know, everybody shares. This is possible. I think the kind of polarization that we leave that does not allow us to have documents like this is entirely made by, by the actors. It's not something that necessarily characteristic to, to Georgia that cannot be overcome. It's just these players that, that uh, see no interest in doing this. And, uh, fundamentally, I think that's what it is. Okay. And so this is also related to the fact that I think the last uh, national security concept, which I'm not sure if it's the same document as what Ukraine has adopted, maybe probably slightly different, has not uh, was adopted, I think, under the previous government, I think 2012 was it. Uh, and since then, there is has been talks of uh, updating, but nothing has happened. Well, we destroyed National Security Council, we don't know under whose umbrella where, uh, I mean, for a country like Georgia to have a non functional National Security Council is, a, is, a, is an incredible thing. And, uh, you know, if the concept has, not, I didn't know that the concept has not been updated since 2012, then, you know, obviously we don't have a resilience document. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, does anyone want to add anything to that? Uh, okay. Then we can move on to the next question, which uh, my Zoom says is from Khatuna Yosarin, but I suspect that this is not the case. Because I see the picture, and this is Irakli Sirbiladze, whom I know very well. So his question is uh, the following. The Russian Federation, although a preponderant power in the former Soviet Union, was lacking legitimacy, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, uh, which is a component part of exercising hegemony. Given what's going on now, can we expect Russia losing legitimacy elsewhere in the rest of the former Soviet Union or weak Russia? Uh, will still be strong in its, uh, will uh, this Russia still be strong in its neighborhood? Uh, we can uh, go with the same uh, order as the presentations, first Neil and Natalia. Uh, thank you. I guess this one is more or less directed at me more than anybody else, but anyway, I'm happy to, Take a crack. I'm, I, I am charmed by the idea that hegemony has something to do with legitimacy. I, I'm, I'm willing to grant that, but I'm, I, it is contestable. Um, the point is, uh, I think the fundamental point of the question is, does what is going on in Ukraine actually strengthen or weaken Russia's position in the neighborhood? That is a really interesting question. Um, and you have to disaggregate it. I think uh, Russia now has a lock on Belarus. That's pretty clear. Um, a, Georgia is ambivalent, but of course it never really agreed with Russian hegemony anyway. 
Armenia and, Az Armenia and Azerbaijan are a mystery. I mean, uh, you can see how each one might have attractive interests towards Russia, but also uh, hostile perspectives on Russia. Not least, I mean, in the Armenian case, Russia left them hanging out to dry in the last war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The really interesting part of this is Central Asia, and nobody talks about this at all. I mean, we have to remember that two weeks before the, or a month before the Ukraine invasion, Russia did a special military operation in Almaty to, and, and, and uh, Nur Sultan in order to restore stability of a legitimate government. Um, I, I have not seen a word, and maybe some of my colleagues can help me out. I've not seen a word from the Central Asian governments on what's going on in Ukraine. Dead silence. I'm not surprised, by the way. I mean, they have their own uh, battles to fight. And the, the key question in Central Asia is really the contestation of hegemony between Russia, which has strengths in security issues, and China, which is essentially taking over the Central Asian economy. So uh, I guess my, uh, this is a, this is a, a wash as a, an answer to a question. I think the, the issue is hold that space. Let's see. Okay. Um, I yeah. Um, now, whether it will be weaker um, or uh, strong, well, in some ways, I think Russia emerges from this weekend, even at this point that we, uh, the, the war is not over because we are witnessing a bit of crashing of myths around Russia, which have been nicely created by themselves and by the rest who bought into these myths. This first of all includes the myth about almighty Russian military, which is not looking particularly in good shape as Neil was um, describing. Another myth is about Putin himself, that he is this fantastic strategist that is outsmarting everybody and everyone around the world. Uh, and, and, and this last move is definitely not his strongest one, uh, can agree um, on this. And another um, myth, I think, which has been very much cultivated by Russia for a very long time is this idea that Russia represents a legitimate, in that sense they claim legitimacy, alternative to the US-led liberal order. And the flirtations with China at that time when they were doing it before the beginning of the war, they were doing it from a much stronger position. And there is a very interesting agreement or memorandum or statement, I don't know what it is, that they signed on 1st of February, which is basically an um, announcement of an alternative model. And they're there together. And I think that has also taken a serious battering as a result of this. I think China is being very careful. China is looking at it. China is thinking about Taiwan. Taiwan is looking about the very strong Western response um, and the kind of alliance that we saw between Russia and China is no longer there. It will be different one. And there again, Russia might be in a, in a position, it had already been a kind of a weaker link, but now in particular. So all of this, the, the changing balance of power relationship with China will definitely affect Russians positions in Central Asia. Um, the uh, Western response, uh, the strong Western response to contain Russia will affect obviously the other parts of uh, the neighborhood. And I do believe also that whether this war uh, ends in victory or defeat for Russia, the uh, decisive say, um, it is the West that will have a decisive say. I mean, Ukraine is fighting this war on the ground, but it is up to the West and the response and the conditions that will, will be imposed to turn this into either victory or a kind of lame compromise that white might turn against um, us again. If it is some kind of a lame compromise, 
that means that positions, Russia might be able to regain its positions very quickly again in the neighborhood. Um, but apart from that, it's looking, you know, Belarus is clearly uh, under Russia. Uh, there again, we don't know if there is a serious defeat, how this will um, play out, uh, because there is a growing opposition in Belarus, something that was not there before, uh, uh, politically organized and supported by the West. Um, Armenia supports Russia, well, for reasons that we all know. Azerbaijan is probably looking for an opportunity to sell more gas and make the, uh, if they have it, <laughs> well, it's also a question, but to use, um, to position themselves as uh, providers of energy security more than before. So, I mean, in interesting um, um, fallout for the region, I think, the entire former Soviet space. Thank you. Max, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I think I quite like how, how um, Iraqi formulated the question. So we're, yeah, we're looking about uh, the uh, yeah, legitimacy hegemony and, you know, can they be weakened but still stay strong in the region? I think there's, th th this is going to be an interesting development. It's, I mean, my first uh, caveat would be it's very difficult to say now uh, because we don't know about the scale of what I hope is going to be Russia's defeat. I mean, Russia definitely will be weaker. Economically, it's already happening. It will be much weaker um otherwise but if you look at you know the economic relations within the, the wider region this post-soviet space that you know, nobody likes to be referred to in georgia but you know if you look at what's happening in central asia the economic ties are there you know for I mean, kazakhstan uh, relies on russia for all of its exports regardless of the outcome of the war and this this cannot just cannot change the same is for remittances and the diaspora communities in russia so it, there is a possible scenario by which Russia loses, so in a larger sense, uh, loses the war, loses economically, but those countries still uh, still um, are very much dependent on it. And then I think, as, as Neil was saying, you have to disaggregate and looking at particular country scenarios. And here, is, that's my, my area, if you look at where societies, especially civil societies are, there's a big disconnect between this and where the governments are. So if I understand correctly, most of Azerbaijanis, I know it's very difficult to get you know, accurate sociological data, but most of Azerbaijanis seem to be supportive of Ukraine. It doesn't mean that the government is going to go there because that's not what they, they, what they do. And uh, the same in Armenia. Again, I don't know the numbers, maybe it's not a majority, but there's a substantial constituency supporting uh, uh, Ukraine and Armenia, but it, it's not trans it's not really translated into into political reality because of well mostly of where uh, um, Armenia's international alliances are. Uh, so I say yes, it, it is potentially weaker, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it it, it, it will it will translate into much weaker uh, Russia. And then on uh, sorry role in the region. And back to what Neil was saying, I think that we have heard a few voices from Central Asia. I think Kazakhstan is almost got a picture perfect neutrality. They just say you know we 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 don't want. Uh, we don't war, want war, but we're not going to say who started it. And I think Uzbekistan was quite vocal recently. And Uzbekistan has said they will not accept uh, Luhansk and Donetsk Republic's um, independence. And, and that was a pretty um, uh, pretty strong statement by, by their MFA. But also, they always stood a little bit on the sidelines of what happened within CIS. So it's not entirely um, surprising. So yes, weaker Russia, definitely, but maybe not so much weaker in, in the region. And I think for me, the, the essential so the essence of this conflict, the way I see it, is, is really about the values and the, the, the system that you want to live in. If, if the democratic system prevails, if Ukraine wins, that there can be some, some conclusions and, and some changes in, in, the, in those other countries. But if, if at least, you know, there is no clear Ukrainian victory, so we, we can say, yes, Russia didn't win, but it's a kind of, yeah, like a legalized stalemate, stalemate then I think we can expect little change and Russia will just reinforce its positions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we have a question from uh, Lika Zuladze. Uh, how would you assess the Georgian civil society's role in the current conditions? Do you think it has any chance to affect the government's decisions? And how do you see its role in promoting the country's European integration? Uh, these set of questions are not addressed to any uh, of the speakers. So uh, once again, we can go with the same order, Neil, Natalie, and Max. Uh, um, I'll be very brief here. Uh, in, I, I think that there is something we call civil society, and then there is Georgian society. Um, uh, civil society in Georgia, as we refer to it, is very much pro-integration and very active. Georgian society as a whole, I'm not so sure about. Um, 
you know, if you, going back to something Natalie said a while ago, um, speaking of George's intention to join the EU and George's membership application, I mean, the problem, one problem with that is the fact that the Georgian government is simply unwilling to undertake reforms that might actually facilitate EU membership. I think about the judiciary, for example. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, this is a rather rude comment. Um, the point is, it's not clear that Georgia is willing to do what it takes to become a member of the European Union. If it were, uh, willing to take those steps, then this is probably not a bad moment to do it. But since there's no evidence that they are willing to take these steps, it's moot. Um, and to go back to Lika's question, um, in that kind of political context, it's very difficult for civil society as we understand it to have a significant impact on government decisions regarding meeting conditions for accession to the European Union. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, that was also um, my response. I mean, for civil society to be effective uh, as a kind of an instrument, a driver of this process, as, as, um, uh, as a force that can check the progress, um, there should be effective mechanisms for this in place. You know, it's one thing making a post on Facebook, but this is not enough. This is not going to change the or have impact on policy. In order for this to have an impact on policy, the government should be willing and there should be institutional mechanisms to uh, consult civil society, to engage them. They were, these mechanisms existed, they were in place. I just don't see this happening anymore. And in the same kind of polarized landscape that we live, civil society actors are also labeled as pro or for or whatever. So there is basically no neutral space. Um, and this lack of uh, perceived neutrality uh, of civil society also doesn't help. Max? Well, I mean, so yeah, a few things. I mean, first of all, if I look at you know what uh, Georgian civil society's role in the current conditions, I mean, in the Ukraine crisis, I think they've been fantastic, and that's both civil society uh, society at large. So basically, active citizens out there taking to the streets and telling the government is doing a rubbish job of supporting Ukraine. I think that just that there's no no question about that. Of the organized civil society, again here they've really carried the brunt of the activities, organizing, fundraising, and sending help to Ukraine. That's fine. I, I'm not too comfortable with some of the more militant uh, groups within or, uh, organized civil society in Georgia that are also very, very uh, vocally um, anti-Russian and my, in, in, in my view, sometimes xenophobic. So I can't, I can't really say much about that. But if I look at what, I mean, what, what is the, the role, I think there's fantastic potential in them supporting the process of European integration. But sadly, in the current yeah, reality of, I mean, polarization has many faces in Georgia, but I think in this case, obviously Georgian Dream sees at least organized civil society, so civil society organizations as a political actor and as an enemy, an adversary in most cases. So they are, they are, not, uh, they are not an independent actor as you see in many countries. I mean, if I look back at Poland, the Polish government makes maybe similar accusations against some organizations, but not all. But I think in, in the understanding is, and there's also the nature and the structure of organized civil society in Georgia, you have a, a lot of expert NGOs, smaller sized, uh, you know, seated in Tbilisi and the government sees most of them as enemies or as you hear again, if you read Georgian, you know, they say all sorts of horrible things about them being uh, Saakashvili's lackeys, right? So, so I think there is there is a, a lot of work to be done on, on, on lowering the tension so they can fulfill their expert role. And I think the expert role I'm not worried about. What I'm worried about is that the Georgian civil society organizations, at least, have a huge image problem. They're just not hugely popular in Georgian society. Uh, membership le levels are not great. You don't have those big membership driven organizations such as trade unions, uh, other, I mean, if you see the church, but there's a separate story. Let's not go there. At least not in this, uh, not in this um, event. And um, so again, a, a lot of work for Georgian civil society and for everybody really to make sure that you know there's there's space and there are support measures, including policy, including tax breaks, and so on, so people can join voluntary organizations, can that are membership driven movements. And this is where strength of civil society comes from, not for the expertise of formidable outlets sometimes, such as, you know, Transparency International Judge and Georgian Young Lawyers. So I'm not worried about the expertise front 
but more about the popular appeal. And I think there is a, a lot of work to be done there. If you plug this gap, then I think there's tremendous potential of Georgia's civil society to, uh, to help in European integration and hopefully you know, not to plug gaps where Georgian government's inaction has just left a vacuum. Thank you. So we have exactly five minutes left, and I think it should be enough for one more question. Um, let me ask a question uh, of my, my own question. Um, so we talked about um, hegemony, Russian hegemony in, in this, in his in their neighborhood, um, and how will this war affect? Let me ask a question about the domestic political hegemony of Georgian Dream, which uh, Natalie briefly touched upon. So uh, what do you think? And uh, my question is directly to all, all three of you. Uh, will this war affect, uh, will it change the balance of power inside Georgia? Will it strengthen or weaken the ruling party, Georgian Trim? Because my understanding is that at least based on this uh, large demonstrations in Tbilisi that a uh, large part of, of the society is uh, dissatisfied with uh, the Georgian Dream's response to the war. Uh, is it uh, are these protests representative of the of Georgia society as a whole, and will it affect Georgian Dream's popularity and its uh, power uh, in the next couple of years? Uh, Neil, please you, you may start. Uh, thank you. I don't know why I always go first, but there we are. I guess it's the order of play. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I I am quite aware of these very large pro-Ukrainian demonstrations and the expressions of uh, discontent with the quietude of the Georgian government's approach to the Ukraine issue. By the way, uh, as it happens, uh, I, I, this will be a rare statement for me because I don't really make statements in favor of any Georgian policy. But uh, I think, the government is right to be very careful on this one, because uh, if Putin is looking for compensation for failure in Ukraine, he could get it easily here. I'm, I'm sitting in Tbilisi, by the way. So I, I, I think caution is important at the moment. Um, as for whether the war itself has an impact on the balance of power in Georgia, I, I'm sorry to be uh, ambivalent here. Um, it depends how the war turns out. Okay. Natalie, you can... Uh, yeah, um, I, I share Neil's ambivalence because it's actually hard to tell. It may appear the kind of outpouring of support that we see, it, um, it happens in Georgia. It's, it's kind of reaches emotional peak. But in the last uh, period, I don't know, last few years, I did not really see that translate into serious damage to Georgian dream. And I wouldn't necessarily expect that to be the case now either, partly because the main source of Georgian Dream's power is not Georgian Dream itself, but it's the lack of alternatives or rather viable uh, opposition. Um, and as long as, as as long as that is perpetuated, and you know there are structural reasons why it is difficult for viable opposition to emerge, which is also thanks to Georgia and Dream. But OK, that's a, a bigger question. But fundamentally, unless these structural positions, uh, yeah, conditions change, it will be difficult to, uh, to move it. Um, and then I also have to say that they have been pretty good at doing a bit of fear mongering. And there is a fear in the Georgian public, which is understandable. Right. I mean, 2008 was not so long ago. Um, I don't think it is a good policy choice to do the fear mongering, but that's what they're doing. And this way, kind of contrasting themselves to in, 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 in this picture, kind of reckless opposition that is being um, uh, not very careful. And I have the feeling in a way with some at least segments of population, particularly those who have been traditional supporters of GB, that does resonate. Thank you. Max, if you would 
would like to add anything, but very yeah, briefly. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think a lot of the ground, the ground has already been covered. I think I'll, I'll allow myself to be cautiously optimistic in a sense that I think there is a chance that this can translate into uh, some political change in Georgia, and, but this uh, it's very short term at the moment. So I think that the fact that Georgians are very unhappy about the way Georgian government has handled Ukraine war uh, is already translating in the decrease in popularity, but whether it's a short dip or it's a long term trend, we just don't know. But I think that the numbers are already there, so Georgian dream is less and less popular. But as Natalie was saying already, you know, the, the, this is not the only source of their strength. The assess of the strength is weakness of the opposition, and I've not seen anybody coming up with great ideas here um, over the last couple of weeks, other than civil society stepping in when there was a vacuum. But politically, I've not really seen um, a response that would be any different from what we saw in the past. So potentially, it could it, it could contribute to reshaping of, of the Georgian political sphere. But at the moment, it's just yeah, a, a little, a, um, yeah. Um, a little stone uh, that can then be joined by others, but not much more than this. Um, thank you. Uh, our time is up. So I would like to thank uh, all the participants, the speakers and the audience for participating in uh, our today's discussion and um, take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you thank everyone. You. Thanks for interesting. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Bye.